We're going to start in the GLIAC. Ferris State hosting Saginaw Valley, two of the teams that we featured there in our Super Region 3 Top 10. I shouldn't say our. I didn't make it. In the Super Region Top 10, they squared off this weekend in Big Rapids. Ferris State takes it 27-24. This one was all over the place. Trying to keep up with this one. I was up at Michigan Tech watching Grand Valley play the Huskies. And Saginaw Valley had a lead in this one. They actually, uh, you know, at the half, Ferris State was uh, only leading by three points, 20-17. to 17. Saginaw, at one point, had multiple, I shouldn't say one point, had multiple leads throughout the big tight end taking the ball down the, down the sideline there. But uh, their offense had a lot going for them, had some good things in the special teams department. And... Ferris in the second half, ultimately their defense stepped up big time, was able to generate some big plays, and was ahead 27-17 in the third quarter. Saginaw would score in the third to make it 24-27 here, but uh, in the fourth, no scores. Both defenses stepping up, but Ferris is a lot more timely in doing so. You talk about some of the special teams plays right there. How about a blocked field goal from that Saginaw front? Again, though, Trinidad Chan was this one off to Brady Rose to the right side in the end zone. He has looked... Really unstoppable Trinidad, that being under center for them. And this Fair State defense, that front seven, continues to be a very potent group to play against. Saginaw, giving them fits, unfortunately, for the Cardinals. Just not enough to upend the Bulldogs, even though it had some good takeaways. You see one of the interceptions there through the air for this Cardinal defense. Uh, but again... Not quite enough to take off Ferris State. And I think one of the more impressive feats of this Ferris State defense, I mean, 100 yards rushing for the Saginaw team, that's you know not a lot compared to what we've seen from them throughout the course of the year. But that Saginaw defense is what we've come to really expect a lot out of. There's their head coach, Ryan Brady. That rushing defense and that defense of a unit in general for Saginaw has been really solid. Ferris State was ground and pound, 171 yards on the ground and uh, 217 through the air. So they, they did a lot of damage offensively, relatively speaking to what we've seen this Saginaw Valley team give up. Now, that amount of yards against Ferris State, typically, that would be a win. But um, for Ferris State, they expect a lot out of themselves, and, and rightfully so. 21 first downs to Saginaw's 13. Three sacks for Ferris State. Had a punch out on the on the fumble, but did throw that one interception. And yeah, I mean, those are kind of the, the bigger cliff notes for this. So Ferris State holds on. And I think uh, one of the bigger notes from this is that uh, the last three weeks, the number one team in the country has been knocked off. Right? I think that's a really big point out of it. Harding gets beat by Wachita. Then you go on and Grand Valley gets beat by Ferris. And then Pittsburgh State goes and gets beat. And now Ferris was very close to being the fourth team, number one ranked consecutively, to get knocked off the top. They survive here and hang on. Ferris clinches at least a share of the GLIAC Championship. They play Davenport in the first Calder City Classic. A new rivalry game next week for the outright title over here in the GLIAC. Saginaw Valley's 24 points were the most allowed by the Bulldogs all season. The team, the Fair State team, had outscored opponents 405 to 69 since the Pittsburgh State loss. You talk about a different team from week zero to week 10. Fair State is the shining example of that so um we'll go over and talk a little bit about this angelo state western oregon game and admittedly we won't talk too much about it because we do have kenton allen coming on later in the show the linebacker for the rams will come on and discuss this game and, and just talk about uh the rams right now a little bit more in detail but what you need to know about this one i don't have as good of cut up highlights from this one this these highlights are from flow and uh, i should shout out as well those highlights from saginaw are from abc 12 so i appreciate those guys putting out some good content covering small school football but talking about this one number 20 angelo state goes on the road they visit western oregon they take this one 38 to 16 and angelo state are lone star conference champs for the second time in three years and this rams team I talked about it earlier, but they started the year 0-2. You lose to Fort Hayes State. You lose to Emporia State. Two top-quality MIAA opponents. Then you turn it on when you get into Lone Star Conference play. And it's not to say, I, I don't necessarily think this was maybe a wire-to-wire -wire victory for them. By the way, these Western Oregon uniforms, absolutely clean. Those black with the red accents are ridiculously cool. Western Oregon gets on the board first here with a field goal. And... Looking at this one, like I said, it wasn't necessarily a wire-to-wire -wire type of game. Uh, Angelo State taking a lot of shots through the air on this one. That was the first of many. 
for that passing attack. They'd even things up at a field goal apiece, three to three, and then would go on to score two touchdowns. And it was 17-3. Now, Western Oregon would fight back, though. Going into halftime, 17-13, the Rams led. Into the second half, that Rams defense stepped up. 38-16 is the final. And Angelo State, that defensive front, the defensive kind of that front seven who play in the box there, really stepped up, made a lot of big-time plays down the stretch. You can see they had the quarterback here for Western Oregon scrambling. And they were still able to make a lot of plays. That completion right there was one of of many that they were able to make happen, but uh, not enough to to upset this Rams team. And again, they take the Lone Star Conference title outright. Here's the, uh, there's the graphic right there. Sweet graphic, by the way. Absolutely really cool. Um, But Lone Star Conference champions for the second time in three years. And 2022 was the last time this team really made a playoff push. They made it to the second round and got beat by Colorado Mines. We've got a lot of guys. I say we, I'm not affiliated. They have a lot of guys in this team that were a part of that squad, that have playoff and, and kind of that postseason experience that I think is going to be very, very important for them moving on. They close out the year against West Texas A&M next week. Could have important seeding implications for the Rams who are kind of middle of the road right now in the Super Region rankings. A win against the Buffaloes, excuse me, could propel them up to, I don't think they would earn themselves a home game kind of where things are slated, but you never know. All it takes is for someone else to lose and for them to win, and they could be hosting a playoff game for the Rams. Okay, let's move over here. CIAA, Fayetteville State, Winston-Salem State, two teams that have experienced a good amount of success this season, but how did this one pan out? Shout out to WSSU Ram Life for the video. Homecoming for Winston-Salem, and they would improve to 7-3 and three on the year. It would take two overtimes, though, to make it happen. Winston-Salem State, 37-31 over Fayetteville. They got off to a decent start, but this one was incredibly back and forth. The first half saw almost no scoring. It was 10-7, Winston-Salem at halftime. And really, the majority of the scoring here happened in the fourth quarter. Two touchdowns, or excuse me, a touchdown and field goal from both squads had things tied up at 24 apiece. In the first overtime, both teams would go on and score. And in the second one, Winston-Salem, they got the ball. They made it happen. Fayetteville, not so much. And the Rams take the win behind some pretty solid offensive performances. Three touchdowns through the air for Dalen Lee. He was 21 to 37 for 200 yards on top of that. Leading rusher was uh, Asa Barnes. Hopefully I'm not saying that one correctly. 18 carries, 73 yards, and a touchdown himself on the day. Um, Some decent performances on that defensive front as well. You had... Five different Rams in the backfield registering sacks. A lot of different guys with PBUs, led by Dante Bolding and Jamison Alsto. Um, some big time performances there for this Winston Salem State squad. But uh, there you can see some of the some of the post game celebration there. I absolutely love that. Um, looks like a really fun environment over there, and a big time win for this Rams team uh, on homecoming once again, which feels pretty sweet. Let's go over to the NSIC. We've got the key to the city game, and a game that I admittedly was not nearly as familiar with as I should be. A really cool rivalry based on the fact that these two teams are just geographically so close over there in Sioux Falls. And so uh, this one, uh, I'm going to fast forward and kind of show you the ending here of how this one panned out. Sioux Falls goes to the Hail Mary. Augie knocks it down to close things out, and then... After the fact here, running over to grab the aforementioned key to the city, which again, what a cool deal. What a cool trophy. That is absolutely awesome. Uh, Number zero there, Epperson. Jared Epperson has been having a phenomenal year for this Augie attack. He had a career best 202 yards. There he is holding the key on Saturday. He scored two touchdowns in each of the last four games for the Vikings. That is playing at an incredible clip. This Augustana team, number two right now in the Super Region rankings we talked about earlier And Augustana, they clinch at least a share of the NSIC title. They're at Bemidji State next week. It's a big-time matchup in the NSIC. They win that. They're the outright NSIC champions. Augustana team inside a conference play has been electric the last couple of seasons in a conference that we know is very deep. I don't want that to, to be left out. This conference is incredibly deep. You look at Sioux Falls, who just gave them a great game. They have three losses on the year. The Sioux Falls team does, and they are damn good. Uh, But going down the performances here... 
Gunnar Hensley for Augie, 16 to 25, 271 and a touchdown through the air. We talked about Jer- uh, Jared Epperson. I mean, he's been a monster. Uh, led through the air on the receiving end by Jack Fisher with six catches and 99 yards. And defensively, you had Cade Lynott with two sacks in the day and a forced fumble as well as a PBU. Hayden Wallace had an interception for that Augie defense. And Augustana, man, seems like they are playing their best football at this time of the year, which is a great sign for this program. There are two losses, one coming to the number one FCS-ranked team at the time, South Dakota State. The next one was that shocker against MSU Moorhead in week two of the NSIC season. But uh, from there on out, they have won their next one, two, three, four, five, six, seven games. And a lot of them have been tight. Some have been convincing. But they've won them all the same. So be curious to see what that Bemidji State final looks like. Um this coming week in the NSIC. And you know what? Whatever it looks like, will it have any implication on, on the playoffs? Bemidji State is very much on the outside looking in. And could that be a playoff game or play in game, excuse me, for the Beavers? I don't think so. But crazier things have happened. For Augustana, you certainly want to keep that number two spot in the Super Region rankings and have the potential to host a home playoff game for Augie. That is another great incentive for them. But we'll move over. I should say we should move back to the CIAA, Virginia Union at Virginia State. And this one is is interesting for a couple reasons here. As I try and I'm stalling right now. I wait for this ad ad to finish playing so that I can actually play the highlights for you guys. Um, But this one is interesting, like I said, for maybe a couple different reasons, actually. And the first of which... Excuse me, shout out to uh, ABC8 for the highlights here of this one. The first of which is is uh, interesting is that we get a rematch next week in the CIAA Championship in Salem, Virginia. But in this game, before we get talking about the CIAA Championship, Virginia State, the Trojans take this one 35-28, a very highly contested type of rivalry type matchup for these two teams. Virginia Union had a really strong offense both on the ground and in the air coming into this one. And Virginia State, we knew what to expect from them. The last time the Trojans and the Panthers met in the post season was in 1993 so um not as to say that uh i believe it was the postseason or the championship one of the two but uh let's just say these teams have not played quote unquote a lot of meaningful football against each other in in maybe a while when it came to the postseason type implications we are going to get a rematch here though between the trojans and the panthers which i for one am excited about but you look at some of the individual performances from this one excuse me um, Virginia Union, Jada Byers. We talked, I mean, we talk about Virginia Union. He's the one face that kind of comes up all the time. He got his in this one. 29 carries, but 106 yards on 29 carries for Jada Byers is damn near shut down for this Trojan defense. And that is a really, really positive point and a, a great reason why they probably took this one out. Now, uh, Romello Williams for VSU, he had, was 14 for 23, 294, three touchdowns, did have an interception through the air. Uh, Jamil Williams, 22 carries, 100 yards, or 88 yards in net yards, I should say, and a touchdown. But uh, Malik Hunter, I think, was one of the the heroes of this one. Six catches, 197 yards, and a touchdown, that being a 91-yarder. Whoa. That helps the stat book a lot. Defensively, K.J. McNeil for that Virginia State squad had one of the takeaways through the air, and then Levante Gator, excuse me, had a second one with Deshaun Coleman picking up the third interception of the day. Three takeaways for that Trojan defense for Virginia State. That was probably the biggest point that uh, they made in order to pick up that win. Back over in Super Region number four. And it's number six, Colorado State Pueblo taking on number 21, Colorado Mines. Highlights courtesy of KKTV11. Shout out to them as I'll pull those up in just a second. I love, I probably should pay for like YouTube premium at this point. But who knows if I'll ever get there. Uh, But the Thunderwolves. Playing host to the ore diggers in this one. They got a lot of snow over there in Pueblo. The Thankfully, the grounds crew were able to get the snow off the field and get this one underway. A forced fumble here early on for Pueblo, and that was kind of the start of the end for this Mines team. Pueblo goes on to roll 28-13 to over Mines, and this is really statement win for this Pueblo team of changing the tide, maybe the passing of a torch, so to speak, over there in the Armac. This snaps a five-game losing skid against the Ore Diggers for this Thunderwolf squad. They claim at least a share of the Armac title and close out this weekend at Shadron State, which 
has been playing some decent ball, so it's not a gimme, but you would expect the pack to continue their success. Speaking of the pack, they extend its RMAC win streak to 15 consecutive games. CSU Pueblo has won inside, excuse me, of the conference. That is incredible. That really is. And again, I'd be remiss. You talk about Pueblo, you have to talk about Reggie Retzlaff. Seven catches, 139 yards, two touchdowns, both of them in the second half. And he's a guy that shows up exactly when you need him to if you're a, if you're a Pueblo fan here. On the ground, Pueblo did not have too much going for them. Um, but through the air, Roman Fuller, 25-34, 270, and three touchdowns. No giveaways through the air. The Pueblo defense also able to generate two turnovers, interceptions against the backup quarterback for Mines, but still a talented offense. I don't want to take anything away from this Pueblo defense. Peyton Shaw and Daniel Bone, who we talked about the latter of those guys quite a bit, um, were two pieces there on that defensive front. But the interceptions coming from Caden Rollo and Eli Pittman. Two takeaways through the air. Uh, Gary Seidenberger with two sacks on the day. Rolo had another one to add, along with Cody Ramming and uh, Makia Scipio. Two sacks as well, as long as uh, as well as a forced fumble. So it feels like again, the CSU Pueblo team is playing a multifaceted football, playing well in all three stages, which is dangerous. They're also getting hot at the right time. And it feels like inside of the RMAC, they've slayed all their demons, right? You take out a really solid Western Colorado team. You snap a five-game losing streak to a uh, Colorado School of Mines, the Ore Digger team there. Now, I mean, what's next? you got to take on Shadron State this weekend, and you're looking at hosting multiple playoff games. If you can take care of business these next couple weeks, you're going to be hosting. You'll be the number one seed in that region in SR4. And that we could be saying a lot more playoff football down there in the newly renovated Thunderdome. But back to Super Region number three. The MIAA has a new champion, potentially. Um, number seven, Central Oklahoma at Washburn. And again, fast forward, they take this one 28-27 on this play. Watch, just to set the scene, Washburn setting up a field goal for the win. This is what happens. UCO gets a hand on it. The ball doesn't even make it there. The Bronchos storm the field as time expires. They clinch a share of the MIAA title for the first time ever. Now, they joined the league, I think, in like 2008 or 2012. They haven't been around like forever. But uh, again, the first time in their team's history that they've clinched at least a portion of the MIAA title. The blocked field goal here as time expires. And that's a big-time win for this Broncho team that has just found a way to get it done against quality opponents week in and week out. The offense we know has been absolutely electric. We'll talk about them in just a second, but uh, special team steps up here. Defense steps up in a big way on the road. Emporia State coming into town next week for UCO. Again, absolutely not a gimme. An Emporia State team that is rightfully pissed off right now. Um, but let's talk about that offense for the Bronchos a little bit. Two guys that have been the forefront of this offense, the quarterback and his number one target on the outside. Let's talk about Terrell Davis here for a minute as I pull up this clip. On this touchdown right here, Davis became, became the single-season record holder for receiving touchdowns. That was his 13th of the year against Washburn, and that was the first score of the day there in the first quarter. One more look at it. Jet Huff. Lock and load down the right sideline. Makes two dudes miss and then puts the burners on and gets about five yards of separation before hightailing it into the end zone. Davis has been an absolute monster this year. And not to be outdone by his counterpart, later in the second quarter, this is Jet Huff, the quarterback, right here, throwing to the right side connecting for the score. He becomes a single-season touchdown passing record holder at UCO. That was his 30th of the year for the Bronchos, a guy who, you know, just months ago had not played a game in a UCO uniform. He has come in and just set this league ablaze and has been an absolutely fantastic addition to this UCO offense. We enjoyed having him on the show. I'm excited to hopefully watch him and that potent offense continue to play further into the playoffs. So we'll see what UCL continues to do. Some more quick hitters, though, from another D2 scene. Finley takes down Northwood 27-17 at home ahead of a massive game against Tiffin next week, which definitely has some GMAC implications. Finley very much in the hunt for one of those super region number uh, super region number two spots, I do believe. 
Sorry, I forgot that mixed up. I always forget where the GMAC gets thrown into there. But Finley very much in the hunt for a playoff spot. Just know that. Walsh upsets Ashland 24-10. to And while that might not mean anything for Walsh, I believe they're the Cavaliers, Ashland was very much in the playoff hunt. They've played a great out-of-strength of schedule. They've had some big-time quality wins. Uh, that is the first time that Ashland has gotten beat by Walsh in their history. And that was very much thanks to T.C. Mulk, 314 yards passing from him. Big day from receivers Trey Martin and Garrett Waite. Walsh, man, playing spoiler for the Ashland Eagles squad over there. How about New Haven? They defeated St. Anselm 14-11 to to once again take control of the Northeast 10 Conference. Or, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that is because they beat Assumption as well. So they would be right up on the top there in Bentley. So New Haven right now sitting at that number seven spot. Would have, if the season ended today, they'd be in the playoffs. Central Missouri comes back to beat number 19, Emporia State, on the road 45-36 in a game that saw almost 1,000 yards combined of total offense. UCM, though, they dominated the time of possession. Zach Zabrowski and company under center there for Central Missouri. Again, a team that has three losses but has played some really good football. I mean, if you're in Super Region 3 and you're one of those teams on the top, you would hate, absolutely hate, to see UCM sneak into the playoffs the way they are playing right now. I mentioned it earlier, Livingstone, they handed Johnson C. Smith their second consecutive loss of the season, 15-10, to 10, with a depressing recap on the website. And usually, usually I don't put people on blast like this, but I thought this was worth sharing because I'm doing my research and I'm trying to check up on things. This is on the Johnson C. Smith webpage. Uh, and for those of you listening, don't worry, it'll be a quick read. A title says JCSU ends title hunt to Livingstone 1510. Here's the full recap. The Johnson C. Smith University football team falls to Living fails falls. Sorry, excuse me, I can't read. Falls to Livingstone College in the commemorative classic 1510. With the loss, the Golden Bulls fall out of the CIAA title hunt. The Golden Bulls end the regular season at eight and two. No, how the game happened, no uh, statistical leaders, no silver lining whatsoever. And Cliff noted, footnoted right there, stats are unavailable at this time. <laughs> Man, that hurts though. I mean, your team's 8-0. and You go and lose back-to-back games, and it felt like this was the year for this Golden Bull squad out of the CIAA. And now, you're not only are you not coming out on top, you're not even getting a chance to play for the CIAA championship. That's got to hurt. That certainly has to hurt. But uh, finally, Clark Atlanta, they're moving out of the SIC championship game after a 28-17 win over Morehouse. Rematch with Miles in the championship game, and that Miles team is one that's right up there with JCSU as far as playoff implications. So uh, that game against the Clark Atlanta team that had not won last year, my, my understanding is they are on fire this year. They, I believe, one loss in the season. Uh, I think a lot of people would be inclined to take Miles in that one, but... It would not be the first time that Clark Atlanta has gone and upset someone and surprised many others. So that's it for the D2 football team.